Welcome to Consultations for Health, helping you progress in your communication skills to optimise the care of your patients. And welcome to Healthily Conversations, our new podcast series where we'll be talking to health and social care professionals, finding a little bit about their background, a little bit about their career, and a little bit about how communication skills are vital to their job. So come along, check us out, and check out our Healthily Conversations. The first one will be me being interviewed, so you get a chance to get to know me a little bit better, and then I will be your host taking you through the journey of the other interviews that we do. So check out our socials and check out Consultations for Health. Hi there, my name's Sophie. Um, I'm a content creator for Consultations for Health, and today I'm here with Dr. James Desborough. He is the founder of Consultations for Health, and we thought it might be nice just to kind of sit down with him, get to know his journey through pharmacy, and what led to him creating Consultations for Health. Lovely to meet you again, James. Thanks, Sophie. <laughs> it's a really great opportunity to chat with you about the journey we've been on through uh, Consultations for Health and uh, a little bit about how I got here. Let's just get started into it. We know a little bit about your journey through university, because obviously we study here, but what was your journey like getting into healthcare? So like, do you know, did you have any influential people in your family, you know, around you that kind of influenced you? Yeah, so, so probably not, not consciously uh, aware. Um, my, my mother was, was always ever present and she was a lab technician in a school. So I was working in science and it probably wasn't actually until I'd started my career in pharmacy, I actually learned a little bit about her past um, okay. and I think uh, my mother if she'd been born in a different era um, in a different class would have gone to university and and she tells me probably would have tried to do a course such as pharmacy oh, wow. so without consciously knowing it I had these seeds this enthusiasm of science uh, and my mother will talk about taking me to building sites where there'd be cranes and talking about fulcrums and how, how all these things work and talking about plants and butterflies and it was just part of my mum's natural enthusiasm for science that probably mm -hmm. passed on to me without a, a conscious health care bias to that that development nice it sounds like you were kind of surrounded by this idea of like you know in almost investigating sort of looking into like what goes on behind things maybe yeah I, I, w I was the, the kid digging in the dirt looking in the holes <laughs> looking around trying to find and and probably um very very active uh, child so wanted to be hands-on wanted to be doing stuff mm. well it's a really sort of engaging like it seems like the, the your sort of younger years sound really influential like to sort of maybe your later life what kind of happened in that transition so maybe thinking about like you know high school maybe looking at like a levels. yeah so 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 went 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 through schooling and i, I totally admit i was a, a a lazy academic um through schooling i i don't really recall um having much homework or doing much homework and when i did start to get homework i was setting the alarm at 6.15 in the morning and trying to write it out early doors before I had to come in and go into school. Um, because I was able to get by, I suppose I was lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I got by most of my um, schooling, early schooling uh, with that approach and, and just enjoyed school, enjoyed sport and all the things it had to offer. Um, pharmacy and a career didn't really come on my agenda until probably before GCSEs actually started and um, school made us do a profiling test. Okay. Um, so we did one of these uh, psychometric tests uh, and from that test it, it, it gave a, a range of jobs or career options to go into and um, so pharmacy was on there uh, <laughs> and I remember looking through this list and, and I, I'll be honest with you the decision at the time and, and if you ask my parents or people around me when, before this report came out uh, I said I always wanted to be a bank manager um, I thought I was motivated by money but this report made me realise well maybe actually there's other things I could be suited to and I looked into pharmacy and I'll be honest with you I went oh, that looks all right, looks interesting, and it's got a good salary. I'll go forward and, and do that. And I pick my GCSEs, I pick my A-levels, based on that assumption from that just one report <laughs> that landed on my desk at school in one day, and that's that's the path I chose. Wow. Just just from my own personal experience, I was the opposite. I, I thought that, um, you know, like money was never going to be a motivator, so I, I picked my GCSEs and A-levels based on that I just wanted to help people and just, you know, do all these lovely things. And then actually, for me, it was like, oh, there's a fair bit of money in pharmacy. <laughs> this could be quite cushy. So it's quite nice to hear that the story's kind of gone the other way around for you. Um, obviously, we know that you're a lecturer at UEA, so you've kind of stayed in education. You've kind of, or oh, sorry, i um, you're doing that back in education, but that kind of curiosity for learning, for sort of investigating, like, do you feel that's kind of what brought you to be a lecturer? Or yeah, I, I suppose um, I, I think moving, you know, moving my education journey on going going on to, to university. Um, so so I I ended up uh, at Bradford University, and 
had the best years of my life uh, as, as a university student there. It was an awful lot of fun. OK, and through the, the fun and in enjoyment and engagement in, in some of the, the class we we're having, I tended to find myself as as the sort of subconscious leader in group activities and wanting to create something that was good. Uh, and that's what I that was probably some of those early seeds of actually this sort of teaching aspect of things is something I really enjoy. And I think I've got a, a, a skill for it. Do you feel like that then played a role like obviously you said about this idea of education do you then feel like you went away from it or came back or is it kind of stuck with you throughout no again i suppose uh, you know uh, the the ongoing joke amongst my 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 friends were at university um was that i i have my life mapped out for years ahead um i they they saw me as someone who who was very grand and knew where i was going and and if you'd asked me during my university years what am i going to go on to do I was probably, I initially started my career in a community pharmacy and I was probably thinking, again, the money bit was coming back. I want to, mm. to, to build my empire uh, in pharmacy. Um, uh, and again, it was sort of serendipitous conversations with other people that led me back to an academic um, career. Oh. Um, so uh, I, I effectively was working into that community pharmacy manager, thinking about where my career might go. And I had a phone call from a, a previous lecturer who would come down to UEA to start the course and said, do you want to come and do a PhD? And I had a long conversation. It was in the middle of the pharmacy. It wasn't that busy, the pharmacy. <laughs> chatting about life in Norwich, what it's like. I think my questions were around um, what do you get paid after you finished a PhD? What could I, could I do? The only question I didn't ask was what is the PhD on? <laughs> or it was the very last question because that was not important to me at that time. Um, and probably looking back, uh, this very influential person had identified some attributes in me to come down and say, come, come and be a teacher, come and, do, come and do a PhD, come do research and come and be involved in the academic world. God, that must have been pretty nerve wracking, like this idea of like moving to somewhere completely different, doing a PhD that you're not really, you know, it's not a topic you're necessarily passionate about because they come and sort of head, headhunted you by the sounds of it. Um, how was that transition? That that transition was was a, a point in my life where um, I was seeing um, either my friends all, all partnering up uh, and forming relations. And I was working in community pharmacy, and I was a, a, a young lad working in an environment where I wasn't meeting lots of young people. Mm. So I was at the point where I was either going to go and try and work in a, a big hospital trust and change my career anyway, or let's go back to university and I'm going to be surrounded by lots of um, young, energetic people with similar way uh, outlooks to myself. And so, so from that jump, it was the right thing. It was the right mm-hmm. thing at the right time for me. It wasn't until I was here and I moved, I brought a house, and I was here for about two months. I go, blimey, I knew no one other than this previous lecturer who had only uh, met really through course experiences up in Bradford. Um, and I was, that's, that's a big transition. I just went with it. And, <laughs> and I think probably one of my overriding things I'd say to anybody embarking an early career just go with the opportunities, just grab them, hands up, even if you're not sure how they're going to pan out, because you'll learn an awful lot from just doing that. And even if it doesn't pan out, you've the great thing about pharmacy, and I suppose that's what I always ride on, I've got that, that career, I've got that vocation mm-hmm. as a backup, so I can take these risks. So obviously you move here, buy a house, you're doing your PhD, how was your PhD? Did you enjoy it? So, so, so again, the PhD, what, what was lovely was, was coming to UEA at a point when it was a new school, so they'd only had the first cohort, had only just started, they were a year in, so, so I arrived at the point of the second cohort, so they only had Is a first. Is that the pharmacy school? So, that was for new? the pharmacy yeah. school. Um, and I was the first PhD student in the, the practice area, and they had very few practice members of staff, so um, I... I got a lot of opportunity to do a lot more teaching than probably I should have through my PhD to be honest with you um, as well as being engaged in a, in a region of the country that hadn't had a pharmacy school so the, the research I was doing was in the local community they'd set up a, a new service trying to support people who were struggling with their medication at home and if we can't get them to take the medication they were either going to end up in a care home or have to go back into hospital so this was about how can we send pharmacists out into the, their, their homes and how can we support them to mean that they can manage their medicines and therefore they can stay independent. So after your PhD, you, you've um, finished that, what happened next? 
So, so again, uh, again, I, 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 I call this luck, and it's whether you create your own <laughs> luck or, or whether these things happen. You know, the, the the school's growing. There's an opportunity, and and at that point, I have to say, it was very lucky to to if you looked around most universities, the practice team were made up of practicing members of staff who wanted to come and do a bit of teaching, or there were a, a few academics who'd had a PhD and then were remaining as practice staff. So, to the commodity of a practice PhD was was quite mm. rare. So, I was able to transition straight into a lecturer position without having to do what most academics have to do which is a number of years of what we call postdoctoral work which is usually developing your research um, that bit further. I think in hindsight and thinking about research activities I think I missed that part of the career which I now recognise is very important for academics is to have that period once you've got your PhD which is your rubber stamp that you have the skills to to manage and drive forward your own research to then have that period of two to six years where you can focus purely on your own research and that's what that does without the distraction of some of the other activities. So you've said that obviously university was one of the best times of your life what made it so good? I think um, so so in in all honesty I uh, the University of Bradford wasn't my first choice and I didn't quite get the grades to go to my original UCAS choices. So I ended up going to Bradford through clearing and I, I had a good friend at the time and, and said, you can go to this university going, I didn't quite get where I wanted and you'll always be feeling a little bit negative about it. Or you can go, well, I'm going there and I'd made the decision. I wanted to study pharmacy and I wanted to do it that year. I didn't want to defer a year. And he said, you can go and make it what you make it what you want to make it. You've got a chance for a fresh start in whatever you're doing. And I think what was lovely is not only I went, to Bradford with that approach but I met so many of my friends who have been my best friends for uh, ever since who we all had this similar approach we're here we're going to make the best of being here and that meant it was a fantastic experience um, so whether that be socially whether that be um, through playing sports and activities which are available at university and I think my my top tip whenever I'm speaking to any of my first year advisees is I want you to go and live a university experience which involves doing far more than what the course is doing and I want you to go out and get involved in clubs and societies, get involved in uh, sports and activities, whatever you're interested in or whatever you're not sure you're interested in, go and give it a try. Because one of the great lessons I learned is as a university student, you have, believe it or not, a lot more time and opportunities than you have in later life, but you don't always have the money. So uh, one of the things I did was get more loans than you normally get to get a little bit more money to give me the freedom to do that. And I was able, you know, going into a vocational course to pay those back so so get involved and and get involved in all the opportunities that are there so one of the first opportunities that I took was with the the British Pharmaceutical Students Association Um, they had uh, an annual conference in my first year I went to their annual conference at the University of Nottingham and again had a fantastic week and as off the back of that week I got um, a job in a pharmacy Um, for my holidays I made connections with pharmacy students at a whole range of different universities um, which then meant whenever there were other either BPSA events whether they be sports socials or conferences I was meeting a whole range of more people and it was all about these networks and connections that meant university life was just great and wherever I went in the country there's people I know who I can meet up with and have a good chat and share experiences of the world and the world of pharmacy really sounds like the you know your university experience was kind of jam-packed like you were kind of doing anything and everything you could to you know make your university experience the best that you could what were you kind of like as a student sort of that studying you know so I I um, lived in a house with in my first year my halls were all non-pharmacists and um, I I went to every single class I then would go off and have lots of socials on the course I would have lots of socials with the sports clubs and played sports and then I'd go out with my housemates and they would say you're never around and for the first um I, six weeks of university um sadly I never drank less than four pints a night I I, I never um went to bed before midnight and I never missed a single class um and I did burn myself out a little bit because I was burning the yeah. candle at both ends but uh, but it was that that set the seed that I had all these connections and, and groups mm. I would have said the 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 interesting thing on my graduation um, ball is, uh, is the award I won was Beer Monster to Bookworm. Okay. Uh, so I, I did go and have great socials in those first few years, really make all those connections. And then at Bradford, the great thing was we did a split pre registration placement. It was a sandwich course. So we were halfway through my third year, I went out and did my first pre reg uh, part of my training. And I worked in a, a small independent community pharmacy out, out the back of York. Um, 
and it was from that experience um, I, I was working in a, a, a pharmacy where they, I was their first ever pre-reg trainee and they gave me lots of opportunities again and I took those opportunities and I went, this is definitely the career I want. It really energised my thoughts about the, the training and the career and what I wanted to do. And what it meant is I came back to university and I no longer saw myself as a student. I saw, mm. I recognised that I was a training pharmacist and therefore the opportunities were not about maximising opportunities outside the course. It was maximising the opportunities that the course had and really going, I'm going into this class because I want to learn. I need mm. to learn this stuff because it's going to be important to what I want to do in the future. So I, again, it, it probably was a conscious decision, but it was recognised by my colleagues that I changed my approach. You know, now suddenly the course and studying was more important. Mm, something had switched, something yeah, sort of, had switched. Know, light bulb and, moment. And, and I think one of the things that's great about the, the training of, of pharmacists and what's happening moving forward is it's so important we get the training out there in the real world sooner because then you recognise what you're trying to do, you see the bigger picture and you value your teaching and training a lot more. Um, I think the current course um, that we have in pharmacy where you have a standard four years in the classroom before you have extensive placement or practice experience means that we're not maximising those teaching opportunities early enough. Mm. So I think it's a fantastic move forward we're seeing with the new standards from GPHC that hopefully there'll be more placements, substantial placements, much early earlier on. on in the training experience. And that will mean we will turn students from students into trainee healthcare professionals much earlier in that process. Mm. That that's definitely something that, um, as a pharmacy student now, third year, so going into fourth year and then on to pre-reg, you definitely feel that transition. But had we, you're right, had we have had our placements earlier and you know longer, and, you know, we would have felt that pull that we are training professionals. Like when we do case studies, these these are going to be real patients very soon. So it's nice to see that the GPHC are recognising that, and it, I'm looking forward to seeing what the new graduates look like after. Um, so. Moving on, now talking about pre-reg, um, what was, you said you did a split pre-reg, so a sandwich style, where, you said you did some of it in community, where was the other? I had the opportunity to uh, train at Guys and St Thomas's in London, and I, I secured a, a place there, so I contrasted very small, tiny independent pharmacy with one of the largest teaching hospitals in the UK, uh, in wow. central London. Big contrast um, then. <laughs> big, big contrast, uh, and... Again, had a fantastic time. Uh, it was one of that, that same approach, you know, live life to 100%, put my, my all into working and living in, in London. So again, this involved not just the work side, but the social side. And I think that's important, again, to build relationships and rapport with all your colleagues. Um, and um, had lots of fantastic experiences. In, in a large teaching hospital, you have to stand up, you have to shout for yourself you know, uh, mm -hmm. and you have to go, I want to experience this, I want to go and do this. So taking advantage of going to see whether it be things out of the norm operations, taking advantage of staying late, staying overnight with the residents. You know, this is not something you have to do as part of your pre-reg, but it gives you those experiences, it shapes your career and what you're seeing and helping out, you know, staying late, as a pre-reg, you're supernumerary. You don't have to stay late, but the dispensary is busy. Other people are staying late. That's what you're going to have to be uh, responsible for. So I'd, I'd do that. I'd help out and, and, and really get involved in everything that was going on in the pharmacy department at that time. Um, so again, had a fantastic time and had a really difficult decision of where do I start my career? Do I try and apply for... Uh, one of these large teaching hospitals where I've had this experience or do I return to that experience I had in a community pharmacy environment and I, I chose to go for the community pharmacy um, environment and I went back uh, and worked again in a, in a suburb of a large town in York and, and did some work in a community pharmacy as a community pharmacy manager. I had this fantastic time at Guys and St Thomas's Hospital in London. Um, it is a really, and it's surrounded by people who are very similar to myself. They were highly driven, highly motivated and that created a few challenges for me because everyone is in the same way and you're sort of, it created a, a place where it can be quite competitive. And at that stage, that was not the environment I wanted to work in. The other thing that really swayed that decision, because I was thinking probably purely about that site in London, is I realised that London probably wasn't the place I wanted to remain. I, I, I partly I had these fantastic times and then I found London quite isolating mm. um, when you didn't necessarily have money to go out. Um, uh, so those contrasts, I had big highs in London and I had some lows as well. So I thought, actually, I'm going to return to this sort of more community side, this uh, community place um, and go and forge my career uh, there.
so obviously we can see that sort of this idea of like um education is quite important to you you mentioned about this like one presentation in the student bar and you know you you kind of enjoyed this idea of teaching and you're now a lecturer you kind of went straight into it what were some some of the challenges that you faced when especially you know when you first became a lecturer like how was it having all you know these hundreds of students looking towards you for their education I guess I think I think and again these are these are reflections over a period of time I I I went into these things very fast and probably without real conscious thought and and decision making um, in in why I was doing certain things it it comes back to probably other people around me um, recognizing uh, an innate ability in in what I had and without me realizing what was my natural skill set so I'd had different points uh, and whether uh, whenever I locumed um, uh, I'd go into a pharmacy and very quickly I had lots of stuff you're really good at talking to the patients okay and you have a really good way and and, and part of my natural way of working with people was to help them to understand what was going on so rather than just say can you do this it would be a little bit more explanation about behind why we're doing this and therefore this is the importance of it and and it got a little bit more Mm buy-in from people I was working with and coming to do I suppose the first traditional lectures that that standing up in front of 100 plus students and delivering material I spent ages preparing those first <laughs> lectures really wanted to one make sure the content was as good as it it could be and two really work on the delivery uh, and I probably over curated it to, a, to the point which I had scripted jokes and the moment you have a scripted joke it doesn't quite work um, and, and you lose that natural off the cuff uh, nature to your delivery style but I spent a lot of time investing um, in prepping those early lectures um, and, and again I, it was without conscious thought I was slowly building up this uh, it, sets of experiences uh, from delivering those first initial lectures to designing workshops to moving to designing assessments to to doing marking and this cumulative experience um, came on board now what's great about the world of academia and why I love it and why I'm still here is because you have an awful lot of freedoms and you have the freedom to experiment you have the freedom to go actually I want to teach this subject I could teach it in this way I could teach it in that way and I can adapt that and see how it works and see what works and what doesn't work and you have that freedom to do that not only with your teaching but then the other aspects to do with your research is very unique uh, I think in the world of work uh, and that's what's really kept me here and and it also means it's interesting because you're doing lots of different things there's no two days are the same and the same way as working with patients in a clinical environment people are different people vary and working with my students it's those same interesting challenges or um opportunities to support them and see them grow that really make this job rewarding i think one of the salient points i learned from one of my colleagues um who i'm on a panel with with the gphc when i was talking to them about why they got into teaching and i think this is probably really stuck stuck with me was when i'm in a clinic in a pharmacy i'm helping one patient at a time and that's great and that's really rewarding by training the next generation i'm having a greater influence on trying to make a positive impact on healthcare and the members of the public and the people we're working for and actually that is for me even more rewarding influencing sort of you know the way they're going to go on to practice you know not just one patient the, the way they're going to interact for the rest of their careers like I think you know we, we've obviously filmed a lot with you and it's really obvious that communication skills is something that you kind of live and breathe like even you know the way you deliver lectures the way you you know you interact when we're filming like it's kind of it's just so natural to you but it's it's just really nice to see that like you know you literally do live and breathe communication skills and even when you're saying you know you, you kind of accumulate all this like knowledge you know this trial and error you know this experimentation you were just saying that you were doing that during your pre-reg as well you were kind of throwing yourself in um when you were in your hospital pre-reg you just kind of said, well, I'll do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and, you know, really get a feel for what you do enjoy and where your strengths are. And um, I think that's something that as students where we're trying to figure out where we want to go next. That's really nice to hear that, you know, you didn't necessarily know what you wanted to do straight away. You had to try lots of different things to get it right. Yeah, I, th- I think, and, and I suppose, you know, going on to thinking about communication skills, what when I got to the end of my PhD, and I had some really close friends at the time, and I was had this opportunity to become a lecturer, and I went, I'm not sure... I'm the right person to be an academic. I, if you think about an academic who sits and writes papers a lot of the time, writes mm. grants a lot of the time, and uh, as an academic, it's a really hard career because most of the time you um, are writing a grant to try and get money to do research, and most of the time you're told no, and you have to get used to being told no. 
and then you you get money and that's a great celebration and you've got to deliver this piece of research and then you try and write it up and you're trying to get it to a journal you're trying to have the biggest impact journal because you want to spread that message as far as you can and most of the time you're being told no and it's a career that you have to get used to getting these knockbacks and one of the fundamental skills is communicating by writing and I think that is a weakness I have I, I accept that I don't enjoy sitting down writing it doesn't come to me easily I can do it but I have to spend a bit more time, a bit more effort, and I have to, I've developed those skills over time. They don't come so mm-hmm. naturally as the, 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 spoken, yeah. the spoken word. Um, so I had this real dilemma about, is this the right job for me? And actually, I've lived off that ability <laughs> to communicate <laughs> verbally uh, and do the communication from that perspective, rather than, which is why I'm in a, a scholarship position, um, uh, teaching and sort of management and thinking about how you design courses more than a, a pure research sort of career track. Just to double check, um, what does what does it mean when you say you're in a scholarship position? So, so at the University of East Anglia, we have two sort of uh, pathways for academic staff. Uh, one is the traditional academic teaching and research. We call those ATR staff. Mm-hmm. So around 40% of their time should be focused around the research, about 40% of their time focused around teaching activities, and around 20 would be doing other administrative tasks that are needed to make a school <laughs> course, whatever it be run um, the other track is we have is we have academic teaching and scholarship um, so those staff again about 40 percent around teaching activities but the 40 percent scholarship is about how do you develop and that could be teach materials your area your specialism so rather than doing fundamental underpinning research it's about how you really um get involved and immersed in moving forward your sphere now that could be a very focused content area of topic you teach it could be the way it's taught it could be the way it's assessed but having that bigger understanding so uh, a lot of the time from a from a student's point of view you see us standing up in a classroom and you you're aware that we're marking your exams but there's a big probably black box of what are we doing the rest of the time and Mm. why why aren't these staff more available to us like our our teachers whose full-time job is to be uh, with their students and supporting with their At teaching. Our disposal, you know. Yeah, and, and whereas our job is about make, driving forward, uh, whether it be the research or the scholarship, so it's about creating um, national or international impacts about what you're doing and driving forward your area, your specialism uh, outside. And that's how the universities create reputation and that's how they become um, influences in the world. Uh, and so you want to go to a university that has big influence on the world. Um, and that's what you're looking yeah, for. Yeah, definitely. So you're in the scholarship half of it. So what would you say you're doing currently to drive your sphere of, you know, your so, area? So consultations <laughs> for healthy is one of those things um, that, that, that uh, I'm putting a lot, a lot of impact input into at the moment. So really thinking about how do we develop, teach and train consultation skills, um, not just for primarily pharmacy students, but thinking broader than that uh, about healthcare professionals. And there's there's a growing need. I'm working an awful lot now with with colleagues in some of the the other health schools. And actually, it's an area we all need to Mm -hmm. train and develop. And the parallels and the fundamental skills are the same. And all of the different disciplines have had historical, slightly different ways of approaching it or slightly different ethoses uh, to where they do it. But actually, if we can get the building blocks of the fundamentals in place for everybody, we're going to be moving to a much better place. Um, If we think about medicines as pharmacists, we've heard for years that about 50% of medication is not taken as it's intended to be taken. And that figure has remained fairly static for the last 40 years. And that's probably because for the last 40 years, we haven't changed the way we communicate with our patients. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that's probably the biggest driving force because if it was as easy as giving telling someone, there wouldn't be a healthcare professional in the world who doesn't smoke and is not overweight, because knowledge we know there's this knowledge action gap, um, and we need to change the way we communicate with our patients to support them to work out what are the challenges, what are the drivers for them mm-hmm. about why they may want to have positive health outcomes, and therefore support them in making those decisions that are going to have those positive impacts for what motivates them. Yeah, definitely. We can we see it in obviously our education, but the idea of just telling a patient do this, do that, and they'll go do it. Well, of course they're not going to. We we all. I mean, I'm known not to finish a full course of antibiotics, and I'm a pharmacy student, but I know I know I should. But you know, if I'm just told take one tablet twice a day, like it doesn't mean anything to me. And obviously, that's what we see with our patients. It doesn't mean anything to them either. You were saying about this kind of more unified approach to like communication. You know, we've all. You mentioned about like medicine, um, maybe having their own way of doing it and then nursing having their own way of doing it. You know, do you kind of see consultations for health as maybe a bridge so that all communication 
um, all healthcare? Uh, so, so first of all, just 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 there, I don't think there is there's one rule that fits all. And one of the things I'm very uh, important to me is about creating authenticity in the way you communicate with your patients and as an individual you've got to have your own genuine style and approach what's important that everybody understands the building blocks and the fundamentals of what they're trying to do and what building blocks and fundamentals are more likely to lead to a positive outcome for that interaction that, that com- communication session that consultation when you say like building blocks and fundamentals is that kind of the active listening the the rav stuff or are you thinking something else yeah so, so i think it, it's 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 really uh for me most of the time and, and i see this everything from healthcare interactions to interviewing uh, new staff or students for positions it's about being able to build a rapport with someone it's about once you've established that rapport keeping it um and to do that and to have positive outcomes you need to have a structure and knowing how you can put a structure around what you're doing that helps you as the person who may be leading or driving that uh, that interaction but also helps the patient or the person you're speaking to to really get the most out of that that process and there's lots of different mechanisms by which we can put those things in place and support people with that development so it's just kind of having like a little toolbox almost of things that you can use to sort of encourage that yeah I, th- I think as a, as a trainee healthcare professional it's one knowing that there's toolboxes that are out there yeah. and knowing what the different bits of the toolbox can do mm. and then knowing when to try and use which one and, and that's what you've got to build, put in place for people as they're training leads us nicely on to talk about consultations for health which is why we're here and um, so obviously we know that it started in 2017 and you're the founder um, you know you kind of described having this idea of maybe wanting to do more you know communication is important to you what was kind of the starting process for consultations for health like yeah so um the starting process uh, uh, we are we're allowed to to apply for for study leave to have a effectively a semester where the the standard teaching is removed from us and someone else will pick up your teaching so you have more time whether to be focused on in my case scholarship activities or whether it be research activities and you're allowed to apply that uh, 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 for a set period of time at UBA so I, I, I had a, a period of, of study leave and I was planning what I wanted to do in that, that study leave and I'd been in, in approached by a publisher to, to write a book about consultation skills um, and again it came back to that I, I struggle to sit down and write and the idea of spending six months in a, in a writing retreat <laughs> actually it w- drives me with fear that's not not my <laughs> like natural cabin in the woods yeah, yeah. overlooking a lake that's but not your vibe I, I, i'm about interacting with people i'm about working that's what drives that what motivates me so so i i started thinking actually if i'm going to really want to help support someone with consultation skills a book is is quite a dry approach to that reading words on the page is hard for people to translate that into actually actions and and, and seeing it and and most Definitely. people benefit from that ability to see how things can be done and then start mirroring some of those behaviors in what they're doing so so i started i spent my study leave learning a bit, little bit about um video production learning a little bit about youtube uh, 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 and channels as well as doing my development in in understanding what i wanted to get across um in, in consultations teaching and what, what could be done um so that's where it started um, and I've always, ever since I've had my career, I've, I've tried to work with um, my students. Um, I think, you know, one person, one of the things I do an awful lot in, in my job is work with other people. You, you, you get limited distance when you try and work on your own. And I think students are they're the next generation. They, they, they are full of creative ideas. Um, and we just need, as a member of staff, I just want to harness that. Um, so I've always offered summer studentships. I've always tried to um, employ students to get involved, get work and use their ideas and shape them into resources that can be used. So that started out, we created a virtual dispensary, again, an online resource uh, for students um, that had all the sort of things to do with controlled drugs law in an interactive environment. You know, oh, wow. again, moving away from that static, historic mm. sort of go and look in this book Textbook, or that book yeah. here. This is where you can, can interface with that in a different way. Uh, and I started with, with Courtney. We started consultation for health. I said, Courtney, I've got this idea let's bring it to life uh, uh, and working with 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 Courtney who was there at the start and and what started out as a six-week summer studentship stayed into working with me for a three-year period while she was here at UEA and subsequently I've been able to invite other students such as y- y- yourself uh, and, and Malia into the fold and again it's your ideas that keep the energy keep it being creative and keep coming up with novel new avenues that are important to pursue uh, mm-hmm. and try and get support and teaching and material out there for people to use. 
so so I suppose I just you know this is really great opportunity for me to reflect back on, yeah. on my my life and my career <laughs> um but that 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 unconscious shaping in my early life around science mm. uh, uh, and I suppose health moving into um just that that period of my life where I just grabbed every opportunity and, and went at life 110 miles an hour um, and but that actually meant that I created a good network good support network around me as well as a network of people to bounce ideas off of um, into stumbling into an academic career um, but really now valuing and appreciating what opportunities I have and what a fantastic career it is to work uh, uh, and um, blessed career to work in a university environment with the next generation the next minds who have sh- helped shape lots of the teaching material and teaching things I put together as well as consultations for health YouTube channel it was really lovely to hear you sort of talk so passionately about it and obviously we're glad that you enjoy what you do and you're not sat here wishing the hours away so it's really lovely obviously you've talked us through sort of your journey and what a great journey it sounds it sounds like you've kind of always had a lot on your plate at one time how, how do you manage that obviously you know students we, we feel that we have a lot on our plate so do you have any advice any tips uh i, th- I think um that that as you as you grow older and as you develop into your careers one thing that that happens as you move up sort of seniority ranks is things don't get taken away from you okay as okay. much as they get added to you so you, so what happens is you get more confident in, in managing situations and it comes back to uh really thinking about what the big picture is okay, okay. so what are your priorities in life and i'll be absolutely honest with you my priority in life is my family okay so i've got two young children and my wife and actually what's most important to me is they are healthy and happy and so there's my big goal and mm-hmm. my my goal with my children is to to help develop them into independent adults um uh and my work so so it so i on one hand i i live um i work to live mm-hmm. okay however what i know about myself is that i need driver's motivations i couldn't work in a job but you sometimes come home you had really stressful days at work and you go why am i doing this sort of job why don't I just go and do something where I can switch off the moment I leave home I don't have to think about it but actually I need those I enjoy and thrive on some of those challenges the solving of problems um, that you face uh, in working in, in a challenging career uh, that the academia mm. that academia is so what you need to have you need to have big goals you need to go where am I going okay so so where do we I want to go we, yeah we often talk about you know how do you manage the day-to-day tasks with things like to-do lists when you talk about mm-hmm. time management but you actually need where do I want to be list okay? okay this is where I'm trying to get to so when you're forming your daily on all these tasks come in for the to-do list you're going well how does that fit in to the bigger picture and if it's not helping me get to that bigger picture that's a thing that I might need to say no to. And I think one of the hardest things I have struggled with is saying no. Okay, so one thing is knowing when to say no and, and how to say no. Two, having that big picture of where you're going. Mm-hmm. And three, have those regular sort of lists. This is what I'm working through. Strike through those lists. And one of the challenges I've found since I've had children, so what I used to do is always get through my end of my list before I had children because I'd just stay at work longer. <laughs> uh, now the priority is the family. It's the family. So I, I go home. So I have to rejig those lists. I have to work with a team and have mm-hmm. to recognise this is what I can achieve and I'm now going to need to work with other people. And therefore, if you're going to work with other people, you need to take them on that journey. They need to recognise the goal that mm-hmm. common goal that vision of where you're trying to get to and then if you all can get on board with that goal you all actually work together to achieve the big picture which is the positive outcome you want to have without having to compromise your own self you know your own priorities your own choices absolutely i mean that sounds really so imagine this you've had a stressful day at work but you managed to get everything off the to-do list and you're now back at home what's next on the agenda so so whether it being a, a hard or, or easy day, again, that bigger picture, one of the things I try and do is I, I've always been involved in sport. Mm-hmm. OK, now pre-children, that was team sports, a lot of cricket that takes up a lot of time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and so that was one of the things that I made a decision. Actually, I wasn't going to carry on doing the cricket okay. in the same way. OK, but I needed sport and sport's really important to me. So I do running and cycling. OK, I partly do those two things because they are an opportunity that I can fit them in round things easily. Mm-hmm. So if you think of your life as a big jar, you've got the big balls that fill up lots of space that are the big goals where you're trying to jump to. You then have lots of gaps 
mm-hmm. you need to find things that you can fill those gaps with that are helping you achieve what you want to achieve. So the thing I can fill those gaps with is going for a run, going for a cycle. So I've got to balance that with my, my family life. But I, I've actually now got two or three friends who, who live close to where I, where I am and we arrange and I'll be going out at 6pm tonight for a little <laughs> jog around the village. It's not about the sport. It's not about the speed. It's actually about uh, mental well-being and a debrief mm. just to get out of the house, have some fresh air flowing through us and we just have a chat yeah, on the way around. Out your mates, having a little jog, um, just de-stressing. So, so I, I will do that and I notice when I don't, do a jog or a cycle a few times a week i can really tell how that ups my inability to cope with stresses so so Mm -hmm. again i would really endorse doing something like that the thing you've got to be able to do is you've got to balance those work things so they're always there and knowing what you're trying to do but you've got to be able to switch off so there are times when i'll go right this so often the kids will go to bed so i come home i'll usually have a few hours with the kids dinners putting them to bed stories those sorts of things um and then when they've gone to bed I might be picking up the computer again because there's a few tasks Mm -hmm. to do. I might be switching off, but I'm knowing I'm switching off. Okay, so you need to have those times when you're absolutely switching off. And it's just balancing those downtimes with the achieving of the big goals. And right there on track, you can have reward yourself (laughs) with those uh, family days out, whatever it may be that you're doing and having fun. Definitely. But for you, it's kind of that mindset of, you know, once the, the goals are done, then debrief, like, obviously you said like since having kids and you can't just work you know continuously was that kind of your main go-to before kids just work throughout the day you know keep going until the list was done and then stop yeah I I used to I'd I'd be in work um, usually between seven and a half past and I would go when the the jobs were done or when a a appropriate end point Mm -hmm. and that would usually be between six and seven And, and that was normal I didn't think anything of that Okay, I would then go out. I, w- I would totally switch off them. What I've mm. not been able to do because I'd know I'd d- achieved everything I wanted to do in that day. What I've had to uh, adjust is that well, uh, my time is not my own in that same way now. So actually, I go home and I haven't done everything. And there's a real balance of knowing, okay, that- what can I achieve and being satisfied with what you have achieved. And I think um, whether you work in sort of academic environment or whether you work in a healthcare environment, there are always patients who need your help. Mm. Okay, and you cannot be there you're not serving them best if you burn yourself out so you've got to do your best you can and leave that job going I've done the best I could in the time I was there and I was mm-hmm. available to them and I'm now recharging so I can be so the best can I again. can the next day so you can do it again properly no that's really that's really nice to hear because I think obviously we we hope we have a lot of students watching but also professionals and obviously you know work, working in any healthcare environment you, you kind of I imagine you have that pull, that pull of like, you know, I wish I could do more, I wish I could do more. But as you said, you've got to look after number one, you've got to make sure you're recharged, you're ready to go, but you're also having that downtime to just fully switch off. So that's really good to hear. Thank you. So that pretty much sums up our episode for today. So thank you so much for coming here, James, and sitting down with us and letting us know a little bit more about you and what makes you you. Um, Obviously, you've had me interviewing you today, but next time it's going to be you in the hot seat. How do you feel about that? Yeah, no, I, I've, I, I've got a, a lot to live up to having uh, <laughs> uh, be, been interviewed by, you, by yourself today. I think it's, it, it's really important, uh, you know, sometimes we, we do have to open ourselves up and it, it, it's, uh, you know, an honest dissection of, of sort of my journey and it's made me, it's been beneficial to me. It's, it's really good and I think the, the other thing to say is to look back on what you have achieved and done and that can be helpful to thinking about where you want to go in the future. So I'm looking forward to sitting in your seat, <laughs> asking the questions and hopefully we can get a good range of some of my colleagues and people I, I don't yet know yet but we can share a whole range of experiences of people who work in the healthcare environment and and have to talk with whether that be patients other healthcare professionals and we can learn a lot from their experiences that will hopefully shape everyone else's uh, future development well it's really lovely to hear that you're looking forward to it and you're not dreading it so that's great um just a quick shout out to say make sure you're following us and subscribing um obviously we're hoping to have more videos so please make sure you stay tuned for them don't forget to like and comment if there's anything in particular that you want us to talk about next time but Take care. Bye. (laughs)